Friends, welcome to Children's Liturgy. I'm glad to have this time to spend with you. Before we get started, I'd like to say a prayer. And Tim's going to bring the camera over so that you can see the prayer. And we can maybe say it together even. I'll say it out loud, and if you can read it from your house, maybe you'd like to say it out loud too. Into your spacious heart and loving hands, dear God, I place my fears, my what-ifs, my spinning world and mind. Comfort me with the truth. No fear is too big for the Great One who is always with me. I am never alone. Calming God, bring courage. Tender Spirit, breathe peace. Gentle Jesus, be close. Amen. How are you doing this week? Do you have a spinning mind? Have you been thinking about a lot of things? Have you been listening to the news? There's a lot going on in the world, isn't there? Well, just like we do every week, no matter what the news is, we come together and we spend some time to listen for God. We listen for God in the scripture that we read and in the prayers we say. And to remember, friends, how we listen closely. We listen with our ears. We listen with our minds. And we listen with our hearts. Today, we're um, listening and we're hearing a story about Jesus and his friends. And we call his friends the disciples. This is a picture I colored, and you might have downloaded this from your computer as well. Jesus sent his disciples out to proclaim the good news and heal. Sometimes it's easy to forget because we talk about Jesus as a teacher a lot, but we forget what an important part of his life was his healing ministry. And sometimes we say that people might be sick um, in their body, something might be wrong with them physically, but sometimes people are hurt or sick inside maybe their heart or their soul or they're troubled in their mind. Jesus was an amazing healer because he could come close to people and help them, whether they felt bad in their body or in their spirit. So I think it's really important to remember that when he told his friends to go out, share the good news of God's love and, and heal. So maybe we just can think about that for a while. How are we healed by the good news? And if we think about it, the good news is the story of God's love in the world. So we might think about that. How would knowing about God's love in the world help to heal us when we're hurt in our bodies or our minds or our hearts? Um, what else was I going to tell you about? Oh, and the bulletin. The bulletin has a part of a phrase from one of the letters that Paul wrote to the Romans. And the phrase is, and hope does not disappoint us. Hope does not disappoint us. So all the things that we know, we know that when we put our hope in God, that we will not be disappointed. Those are things that are important important, especially in times of turmoil or trouble or unrest or uncertainty. It seems like we've been living with uncertainty for a long time. First with uh, that sick bug, as my grandson says, the COVID uh, virus, the pandemic that's changed all, all of our lives and the way we 
have stayed in our house and the way we missed the end of the school year and just the way we're just not sure how everything's going to finally work out in the end because it's still evolving, it's still changing. And now there is new, new change in our country and in the world as people realize that there are other things besides that sick bug that we need to pay attention to and we need to pay attention to it right now. And that's about treating people, all people, but especially people of color who have not been treated fairly, to treat everyone fairly and to make sure people of color are not left out, not left out of kindness or justice or opportunity. It's a lot of work and I want to tell you a story and that's this story starts a long time ago. Last week I sh mentioned, I'm going to have Tim point the camera on the picture. This is one of my most um, favorite pictures in the whole world. This picture of Ruby Bridges that was painted by Norman Rockwell. And Norman Rockwell was known for painting um, and illustrating covers for magazines back in the 1940s and the 1950s and 60s. And this particular picture was actually made in 1963. And then it was in a magazine in January of 1964. But the story I have to tell you starts even before he painted that picture. I have a book written by a wonderful author named Toni Morrison. And I'm just going to read a couple of parts of this book to you. This book is called Remember. It's important to remember things that have shaped us, that have shaped our world and changed our world. And Toni Morrison says, years ago, children of different races could not go to school together in many places in the United States. School districts could legally segregate students, keep them apart, keep them separate, segregate students into different schools according to the color of their skin. The law said these separate schools had to be equal. However, many schools for children of color were inferior to the schools for white students. And inferior means that they're less than. They were not as good as the other schools. So there was a family and they wanted their children to go to a good school. And they were not allowed to go to a good school even though it was the law, it was the law, that people should have the right to a good education. So the, um, this family did something. They sued the Board of Education. And that means that they had some people who were lawyers help bring their concern to the court to say, we want our daughters to go to a good school and they're not allowed to because of the color of their skin. And I think this is important for us to remember. Here's a picture of the girls on their walk to school. And, and they say, our parents sued the Board of Education not because they hate them, but because they love us. They are full of hope, but they are determined to, no matter how narrow the path or how long the journey, all of us are on it together. So I thought that was something we should remember, that when people are asking for help, and sometimes you have to get that help by going to court or having a long journey, it's often not because they hate someone else, but it's because they love their children and they want a better world for their children. 
So, something very wonderful did happen. On May 17, 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court announced a decision that changed the way students went to school. At the end of the Brown versus Board of Education case, the Supreme Court, and that's the highest court in our country, declared that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. That means even though you can say they're separate and equal, they're not going to be. The children who have light-colored skin always had better schools, and it was never fair. And so they changed the law, and that gave people of color a chance to go to schools that had much, much better, um, many better resources, much better chances for children to get a good education. That was 1954. I'll bet that seems like a very long time ago. And that was four years before I was born, 1954. The story we hear today about Ruby Bridges, the little girl in the painting, the story we hear today begins in 1960. And in 1960, in the city of New Orleans, I brought a little picture of a map of the United States just to remind us, here we are in Portland, and here's the state of Louisiana, and New Orleans is way down there in Louisiana. Can you see it? Right there. <laughs> in that state, the governor of this state and some of the people in the state did not want to follow the new law that said all children, black, brown, white, all shades should be able to have a good education and go to the same school together. And they, wouldn't, they were not following the law. So finally a group of people got together and they said, we need to do something to make them pay attention to this law. So they had some children, first they had to talk to the parents, but they had some children um, say, yes, I will go to a school where I might be the only black child or the only one or two children of color who are going to go into that school, but I will go and I will help change the way things are done. Well, I wish that that was as easy as it was, that people just said, let's fix this problem, but it's not. Because when it came time, for children to integrate, if segregate is keeping them apart, integrate is putting people together. When it came time for them to integrate the all-white schools, there were people who had signs, who had angry voices, and they stood along the sidewalk of the school along with the local police. And they said, nope, you can't come in. So, what happened? The people who were trying to help the children said, we've got to call the president. And they did. They called the president. And at that time, our president was President Eisenhower. And he said, well, if the local police won't help, I'm going to send in the federal marshals. And the federal marshals are people who work for the whole country and they answer to the president. So they went along with a little girl named Ruby and her mother and they went to guard them, to help them get from Ruby's house to the school and back home again safely. And they walked alongside Ruby as she went into school. And when it was time to go home, they walked with her 
on the way home from school. And that's what you see in the picture, the Norman Rockwell picture. But in the picture, you don't see the marshals' faces because you just see them from about their shoulders on down. But they were marshals. They had a special armband that they wore, so you knew that they were marshals. And they helped Ruby and her mother go safely into school that first day. And Ruby's mother couldn't go with her every day, but after Ruby's mother um, went with her for the first, first day, then she, she said, Ruby, you do what the marshals say and be safe and be a good girl and go to school. And so, so she did and they kept her safe. And it was a scary time because she was only six years old and all these angry grown-ups were outside trying to make her turn around and, and go back home and not want to go to school. But Ruby loved school and she really wanted to go to school. I'm gonna show you a picture of Ruby. This is how she looked when she went to school. There she is. She was starting the first grade. I wonder if any of you lost any teeth the year you went to the first grade. You can see some of her teeth came out. She's about to get her grown-up teeth. And this is her teacher, Barbara Henry. She called her Mrs. Henry. And Mrs. Henry had come from Boston and Boston, when we look at our map, is way up here in the northeast part of our country. And she had come down to Louisiana to teach. And she was the first um, white teacher that Ruby had ever had. When Ruby went to kindergarten, she was in a school and all the children were black and all of the teachers were black. And so when she got to school, she was kind of surprised that her teacher was a white woman. And she wasn't quite sure about her because she thought to herself, well, Mrs. Henry looks very much like these other people outside who are yelling at me. But Mrs. Henry loved Ruby and they became very good friends and she was her teacher the whole year. When Ruby went into school that first morning, she and her mother, you can see how nice she looked that day with her dress and her the bow in her hair. They went into the principal's office when they got to school and they sat down and waited to be told what to do next. But while they waited, all sorts of people came rushing into the building. And the, the parents of the children who had been at that school, they said, I'm taking my child home. So the white parents took their children and they said, they're not going to come to school here anymore. Not if that little girl's going to be there. So that was very sad, very sad. And as it turned out, Ruby went to school the whole year by herself. Just Ruby and Mrs. Henry in her first grade classroom. Can you imagine that? You might be able to imagine that a little bit if you've been home for two months trying to do school at home and you know how much you missed your friends. Ruby was very lonely. She loved Mrs. Henry and she learned a lot, but she was lonely because she wanted friends. I wanted to tell you a little bit of that story myself because I have a storybook that tells that story, but I'm not sure it includes all of the information we have. There's so much to know about this story and it's really important. And um, with this video that you're watching, there are some 
notes that we're going to put in with it so that you and your family can watch some other videos if you're interested. And you can see Ruby when she's all grown up because she's a grown up lady now with her own family. You can see Ruby with one of the marshals who was um, protecting her when she was a little girl and when they met much later when Ruby was grown up. But before we get to that, let me turn on my computer. Oh, I think it might have turned the picture off while, while we were talking. Here we go. I'm going to put in my code again. And we're going to read the story of Ruby Bridges. If I can do this. Here we go. That day when that angry mob of people was outside yelling at Ruby, uh, a young man who was a doctor visiting from Boston named Robert Coles was there. And he became a friend of Ruby's. And he, he would meet with Ruby so that she could talk to him now and then because he, he was a a doctor who worked with children and helped them talk about their feelings and so he ended up writing this book Robert Coles and George Ford is the illustrator and this is a little bit about what happened the story of Ruby Bridges and this is a note from Ruby's mother our Ruby taught us all a lot. She became someone who helped change our country. She was part of history, just like generals and presidents are part of history. They're leaders, and so was Ruby. She led us away from hate, and she led us nearer to knowing each other, the white folks and the black folks. Ruby's mother. Ruby Bridges was born in a small cabin near Tylertown, Mississippi. We were very poor, very, very poor, Ruby said. My daddy worked picking crops. We just barely got by. There were times when we didn't have much to eat. The people who owned the land were bringing in machines to pick the crops, so my daddy lost his job, and that's when we had to move. I remember us leaving. I was four, I think. In 1957, the family moved to New Orleans. Ruby's father became a janitor. Her mother took care of the children during the day. After they were tucked in bed, Ruby's mother went to work scrubbing floors in a bank. Every Sunday, the family went to church. We wanted our children to be near God's spirit, Ruby's mother said. We wanted them to start feeling close to him from the very start. At that time, black children and white children went to separate schools in New Orleans. The black children were not able to receive the same education as the white children. It wasn't fair, and it was against the nation's law. In 1960, a judge ordered four black girls to go to two white elementary schools. Three of the girls were sent to McDonough 19. Six-year-old Ruby Bridges was sent to first grade in the William France Elementary School. Ruby's parents were proud that their daughter had been chosen to take part in an important event in American history they went to church. We sat there and prayed to God, Ruby's mother said, that we'd all be strong and we'd have courage and we'd get through any trouble. And Ruby would be a good girl and she'd hold her head up high and be a credit to her own people and a credit to all the American people. We prayed long and we prayed hard. On Ruby's first day, a large crowd of angry white people gathered outside the France Elementary School. The people carried signs that said they didn't want black children in a white school. 
People called Ruby names. Some wanted to hurt her. The city and state police did not help Ruby. The President of the United States ordered federal marshals to walk with Ruby into the school building. The marshals carried guns. Every day, for weeks that turned into months, Ruby experienced that kind of school day. She walked to the France school surrounded by marshals. Wearing a clean dress and a bow in her hair and carrying her lunch pail, Ruby walked slowly for the first few blocks. As Ruby approached the school, she saw a crowd of people marching up and down the street. Men and women and children shouted at her. They pushed toward her. The marshals kept them from Ruby by threatening to arrest them. Ruby would hurry through the crowd and not say a word. The white people in the neighborhood would not send their children to school. When Ruby got inside the building, she was all alone except for her teacher, Mrs. Henry. There were no other children to keep Ruby company, to play with and learn with, to eat lunch with. But every day, Ruby went into the classroom with a big smile on her face, ready to get down to the business of learning. She was polite and she worked well at her desk, Mrs. Henry said. She enjoyed her time there. She didn't seem nervous or anxious or irritable or scared. She seemed as normal and relaxed as any child I've ever taught. So Ruby began learning how to read and write in an empty classroom, an empty building. Sometimes I look at her and wonder how she did it, said Mrs. Henry, how she went by those mobs and sat here all by herself and yet seemed so relaxed and comfortable. Mrs. Henry would question Ruby in order to find out if the girl was really nervous and afraid, even though she seemed so calm and confident, but Ruby kept saying she was doing fine. The teacher decided to wait and see if Ruby would keep on being so relaxed and hopeful or if she'd gradually begin to wear down or even decide that she no longer wanted to go to school. Then one morning something happened. Mrs. Henry stood by a window in her classroom as she usually did watching Ruby walk toward the school. Suddenly Ruby stopped right in front of the mob of howling and screaming people. She stood there facing all those men and women. She seemed to be talking to them. Mrs. Henry saw Ruby's lips moving and wondered what Ruby could be saying. The crowd seemed ready to kill her. The marshals were frightened. They tried to persuade Ruby to move along. They tried to hurry her into the school, but Ruby wouldn't budge. Then Ruby stopped talking and walked into the school. When she went into the classroom, Mrs. Henry asked what had happened. Mrs. Henry told Ruby that she'd been watching and that she was surprised when Ruby stopped and talked with the people in the mob. Ruby became irritated. I didn't stop and talk with them, she said. Ruby, I saw you talking, Mrs. Henry said. I saw your lips moving. I wasn't talking, said Ruby. I was praying. I was praying for them. Every morning, Ruby had stopped a few blocks away from the school to say a prayer for the people who hated her. This morning, she forgot until she was already in the middle of the angry mob. When school was over for the day, Ruby hurried through the mob as usual. After she walked a few blocks and the crowd was behind her, Ruby said the prayer she repeated twice a day, before and after school. Please God, Try to forgive those people because even if they say those bad things, they don't know what they're doing. So you could forgive them, just like you did those folks a long time ago when they said terrible things about you.
And that's the end of this story. The story of Ruby Bridges. And there is so much more to learn about Ruby in a book that she wrote herself. And this book is called Through My Eyes, Ruby Bridges. And there's so much to learn about Ruby and all of the people. There you can see some people who were angry and holding signs. They didn't want children of color to come into their neighborhood or their school. Here's a picture. It's a little fuzzy, but this is Mrs. Henry and Ruby when they're in the classroom together. And here's the picture that Norman Rockwell painted. Anyway, there's so much more. There's, there's just more than we have time to talk about today. But I wanted to share that with you. When you heard that story, what did you think? What did you think about Ruby? Did you have a feeling about what kind of a person she was, what kind of a family she came from, what was important to them. During that whole school year, she, um, she said sometimes she would have bad dreams at night. And if she went in to talk to her mother about that, her mother always reminded her to say her prayers and that that would help. And she said, I would do that. I would go back to my room and I would say my prayers. And she said, and it always seemed to help. So I think that um, being close to God was something very important to that family. If you were going to identify a virtue or two, a characteristic laid out down deep inside of Ruby, that helped her be the person she was. What would you think when you uh, when you hear, heard that story? What would you think? The first one I thought of is courage. I thought of about ten different virtues. I'm only going to talk about two. Courage. Do you think she had courage? I want you to know, friends, that. Um, her whole family had to have courage. Do you know what happened to her father? Her father was fired from his job because the person he worked for didn't want him to work for him anymore. So they all took a big risk and it was hard. Some other people came and, and, and helped the family out, but it was hard. Sometimes doing something important and changing a bad law can be a hard and scary thing. And I think the whole family had courage, Ruby especially, only six years old. What is courage? Courage is personal bravery in the face of fear. It is doing what needs to be done even when it is really hard or scary. Courage is going ahead and even when you feel like giving up and quitting. Sometimes courage means recognizing a danger and standing firm. Do you think it was dangerous? Or did it feel dangerous when she walked into that school? It doesn't mean taking unnecessary chances just to look brave. Courage is a quality of the heart. Courage comes from what you feel in your heart rather than just what you think. It comes from knowing yourself and knowing deep down that you can and should do something. Courage comes from knowing that God is there to help and that you can count on God always. 
Love can give us courage. It gives us strength and helps us to do the right thing without letting our fears stop us. So that's one of the main virtues that I saw in that story and what, that I saw in Ruby. Another virtue that I saw that I thought was pretty amazing was that part in the story when she said that she was praying for the people who hated her. Can you imagine doing that? So there are, there are a lot of things that we could say that she did. She, she was loving, she was kind, she was forgiving. The virtue I thought of was the virtue of mercy. And mercy is, let me read this to you. What is mercy? Justice is giving people what they deserve. Mercy is giving people more than they deserve. Mercy is a quality of the heart. Being merciful means to treat others with compassion and forgiveness. That's what she said in the prayer, wasn't it? She asked God to forgive them. When you are being merciful, you are willing to forgive when you have been hurt. And it says, mercy means you feel for someone who is suffering and do something to help them. A mercy is a blessing. When you practice mercy, you are giving others the gift of your tenderness. That's a hard thing to do sometimes, especially if someone has been hurtful to you. And I think that's why Ruby said that prayer. We know that sometimes the only way for us to get through a hard time is to ask for God's help, because some things are too big for us to do on our own. When we're baptized, that's what we say, I will with God's help. We promise to try every day to love our neighbors as ourselves. I will, with God's help, I will respect the dignity of every human being. I will, with God's help. I want you to know that after a very long school year, at the very end of the year, it turned out that a few children did come back into the school and Ruby had a chance to have a couple of friends and that was really good. And by the time that she went to the second grade, lots and lots of children came back to this school and she had many friends. Can you see her here? Does that look like you and some of your friends maybe on the playground? Kids are just having fun hanging out together. So that was in the year 1960, 1961, 62, 63 came, and that's when Norman Rockwell painted that painting of Ruby. Now, if we were to fast forward to the year 2011, guess what happened? That painting went on loan to the White House and President Obama put the painting outside of the President's office and Ruby came to visit. There she is. Ruby and Mrs. Henry became friends when they were grown-ups. They were reunited and someone else Ruby was reunited with was one of the marshals who protected her. This picture is a little fuzzy, but they were reunited. You can see them holding hands there. They're so glad to see each other. The gentleman was 91 years old at that time. If you ever get the chance to go to Massachusetts to the museum, you might get to see Ruby's painting. Here it is on the wall. Sometimes museums move paintings around, so these are all pictures by Norman Rockwell. 
This is in Massachusetts. And that's where Barbara Henry was from. Ruby's teacher was from Massachusetts. That's a lot to think about. It's a lot of story, isn't it? I hope that knowing stories like this gives you courage and gives you the sense that you can do amazing things with God's help, with love, with compassion, with courage. What else do you need, do you think? That might be a good discussion to have with your family. Maybe you have something new you're going to learn or try to do this year. What do you need to reach way down deep inside of yourself to find so that you can do it? And remember, you never have to do it alone because we can always say, God, I need help. It's okay to ask for help. And the people who love us, the people who stood with us when we were baptized, we all together said, I will with God's help. I will always keep you in my prayers. I hope you will keep me in your prayers. And I will always want to come back and share more stories with you. Stories of hope. Stories of being a disciple in the world. Which means it's as much about what you do as what you say. Take care, my friends. Share your love. And I look forward to seeing you next time.